Thank you very much. If you're a doctor, it can be very hard to watch medical dramas on television or the movies because of all the errors. Um, I have a very good friend who's a doctor, and she says she cannot watch it because the number of patients who should already be dead and they're actually alive and being treated is incredible. Or if you're a computer programmer, it's a bit similar, or a technologist, it can be very difficult to see something in it on TV and in film because, in fact, it's egregiously wrong. Uh, the greatest example of this is in a television program called NCIS in the US, where two people type on the same keyboard at the same time. And I have absolutely no idea how that technically works, but somehow it's part of the plot. Behind me is a picture of the doctor from Doctor Who, and he is examining uh, on the right-hand side something that looks very technical. It's a piece of computer code, and he's looking at it very sternly. Um, on the left is the actual thing. It's part of Wikipedia. Um, he's, someone has taken a piece of Wikipedia and put it on screen, and it looks really technical. And one of the issues with computer code is that it just looks really complicated, and it doesn't really matter what you stick up there, because, well, only programmers are going to notice. Unfortunately, programmers do notice, and my blog became incredibly popular amongst those of us who can't help seeing our job depicted on screen. And when you see a bit of Wikipedia, you think, seriously, they're still using Wikipedia at that point? Um, I was watching a film called Elysium with Jodie Foster, and at some point Jodie Foster, in typical Jodie Foster fashion, decides to take power of this space station, and she needs some code written because well, how do you get stuff done these days anyway? You write some code, right? Everything has become code. And this flashed up on the screen on the right-hand side here. And I looked at it and I said, I recognize that because I actually know how to program in Intel assembly language. And that's actually straight out of the manual. And in fact, it is straight out of the manual. That's the manual on the left there where they literally just typed it in and only changed a couple of things. Actually, they removed some comments to try and make it look even more exciting. So in the future, space stations will still be running on the same sort of chip that's in a, in a Windows PC. Um, but it got me thinking about, in general, the depiction of computers in film over time. So this is a very nerdy side of it, which is, OK, that's not the right program. You know, Iron Man, if you watch the movie, actually runs on Lego uh, when you get into the programming. And it made me think about you know, the depiction of technology and computers in general. So if you go back to 1927 with Metropolis, it doesn't start well. I mean, the first robotic character, or the, the, this, this half-woman, half-robot, um, is pretty menacing. And there's an oppressed underclass and rich people living on the surface. And really, Hollywood didn't start well. And in fact, over time, what's been depicted in film has, has changed quite a lot. And I want to go through that. And the best way to find out is to ask, Pardon me, is to ask Leslie Nielsen. Now, you may think I'm joking. In fact, you probably think, surely he can't be serious. Um, but I am deadly serious about it because Leslie Nielsen appeared in a film in the 50s called Forbidden Planet. And Forbidden Planet is one of the two greatest, in my opinion, science fiction movies of all time. The other one came out not very long ago. Uh, this is also a, a film in which a robot gets uh, its starring role. Even on the title here, it says, Introducing Robbie the Robot. Um, and this is a film about a planet, and oh, here's Leslie Nielsen uh, as the captain, John Adams, uh, on this spaceship. He's gone to this planet, which is an expedition has gone missing. And he gets there, and they say, do not land. You must, I cannot guarantee your safety. And uh, he lands. Right? He's an American space pilot, so obviously he's not going to just not land. So he lands his wonderful spaceship, and uh, he gets on the ground, and... He meets Walter Pidgeon, who says to him, go away, I can't guarantee your safety. And for some reason, I think the main reason is Anne Francis, who is the daughter of Walter Pidgeon, and he's, he's got this crew of men who've been in space for 20 years, he decides to stay despite the warnings. And in doing so, some terrible things start to happen. Now, before I tell you what terrible things start to happen to him, uh, I want to move on to what happened in computers in movies, because in the 50s, if you think about the development of the computer, the computer was really not well developed. There were very few. In fact, there was one business computer in the mid-50s in the UK. So computers in films were particularly mysterious, but by the 60s, computers were starting to appear in businesses, particularly things like banks. And so computers started to appear in films, and they started initially to appear as useful tools. Uh, here's Steve McQueen in a thing called The Honeymoon Machine. And he's figured out that this machine in front of him, which is a Navy computer, can be used to cheat at roulette. So here the computer is just a tool, a wonderful tool. He's going to cheat at roulette. It does end badly, uh, but the machine is capable of doing it. So in 61, it was like, the computer is going to be this useful thing for us. 
And it was so useful that the monkeys even had a computer in one of their episodes, and they use it to design toys. So the, again, the machine is, the computer is seen as not a menacing thing. But as the decade goes on, things start to go wrong. So Michael Caine appeared in a film called The Billion Dollar Brain. And this is about the Soviet Union have this wonderful computer that tells them how to beat the West. And Michael Caine has to deal with it, of course. And of course, he does, as Harry Palmer. But the computer starts to become a bit menacing. And it really gets menacing in 1968, when the computer starts killing people. So Hal comes along, and Hal knows best. So by the end of the decade, you've gone from it'll help us cheat at roulette to it'll kill us. And luckily, there is one savior for us, and that is the computer nerd. And the best computer nerd of all time in any film is Benny Hill in the Italian job as Professor Peach, who shuts down Turin's uh, traffic light system in order for the escape. And this is where the, the savior of all of us is going to be this guy. Well, not hopefully not Benny Hill specifically, but uh, this sort of person. So at the end of that decade, the only hope is the nerd. Now, in the 70s, ah, back on the Forbidden Planet. All right, so back on the Forbidden Planet, they've landed, and, well, they meet the robots. The robot is, turns out to be very useful. It can manufacture whiskey. That's what they use it for. You can see the priorities of people who've been in space for a long time. They meet the daughter, and then they want whiskey. Um, after that, of course, they're American, so they kill it, first of all. They try to kill it, and they don't succeed. And then they get, into, they get to know Altera, and things start to go badly wrong at this point. And... Well, they get attacked by a monster, an invisible monster. And they make this cast of the foot of the monster, because they can't see it. They make it from a thing on the ground. And this is what Walter Pigeon warned them about. So something is, something is on the planet menacing them. And in fact, they can just about see it when it comes near the force field of their ship. It appears like this, and these wonderful special effects which were created. Now, where this monster comes from is very, very important from a technological perspective, but I'm going to detour into the 70s again, because the 70s things go really badly wrong after Hal. So in the 70s, you get, first of all, Westworld, with Yul Brenner plays a robot uh, in a sort of fantasy Disney world, and everything goes wrong. So this is sort of the era of computers go completely wrong and everything goes haywire, um, and everyone starts dying except for one man. Uh, the saviors, of course, are computer nerds. Uh, here's some computer nerds from the same film. And things get really bad in the incredibly exploitative film Demon Seed, in which Julie Christie gets impregnated by a computer and gives birth to a robot baby. Now, this is not only is this the worst possible film ever in terms of the treatment of women and computers at the same time, because uh, it's, it's absolutely atrocious, but also you're not going to give birth to a robot baby, okay? I mean, even in the fantasies of Hollywood. And this was not a B movie. This was MGM made this. This was a big big movie. So the 70s were really pretty depressing for anyone who was in the computer industry. Now in the 80s, something great happened. We all got home computers, right? And suddenly computers were in the home and they were much less worrying. In fact, they became cool. So cool that you could have a tuxedo and a perm and a talking car. I mean, this is how cool computers were. And the computer that was in this car, and this is a picture of it, was actually an Apple II. So the, you know, this is where suddenly things became recognizable. And David Hasselhoff became famous. And throughout this decade, Tron came along, Tron with the incredible graphics that were made. Again, computers were cool again. They weren't raping Julie Christie, thank goodness. And war games. War games were so cool that Ali Sheedy would fall in love with you. This doesn't happen in real life still, actually. This is still a movie thing. Um, you can save the world from a global thermonuclear war. Um, but the worries are still there. There's still this concern that this artificially intelligent thing is going to come along, and this in the case, uh, in the form of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Luckily, Schwarzenegger, he's also running an Apple II. Uh, that's actually an Apple II code in his, in his head-up display. So fortunately, the machines uh, that were there weren't actually that powerful. And the height of the coolness of computers is 1995's Hackers, where Angelina Jolie plays a hacker. Or maybe, depending on what you like, it's Hugh Jackman in Swordfish in 2001. There's this incredible arc from computers are going to kill us all to now they're so incredibly cool, even Hugh Jackman uses them. But back to the Forbidden Planet, they're getting attacked by this monster. And here's the story that really tells us something, I think, that's a lot deeper than what Hollywood has to generally say about computers, which is they're good or they're bad or they're cool or they're not. The monster continues attacking and continue, starts killing crew members of the ship. And finally, um, 
Well, Leslie Nielsen gets really agitated. You can tell this because his hair is out of place very slightly. He's got this sort of slight quiff here, and he's also got out his ray gun. And he confronts Dr. Morbius and says, tell me the secret. Why, why did you forbid us from coming here? And um, what is it that is attacking my men? Because we can't find it. And Morbius, well, his hair gets disheveled, and they go down, and he says, look, the people who lived on this planet before, called the Krell, they built this enormous machine. And it's fantastically enormous, and the special effects are wonderful for this era. They go down underground. There are thousands and thousands of nuclear reactors powering this gigantic machine. And what this gigantic machine had done is it had allowed the Krell to not need their bodies anymore. So whatever they could think about, they could create. And so this is, for me, the message of what's happening with technology. We're trying to free ourselves from lots of things which are physical and express ourselves over distance, over time, electronically. All these things are extending who we are. And the Krell had done this, and they had created this machine, and they had essentially disappeared because they didn't need to exist as physical things anymore. But they forgot something. Uh, Walter Pigeon here really gets agitated and has a fight. Um, what they forgot was the reptile brain. And so the Krell disappeared, and the crew of the ship that Pigeon had been on had also been killed by themselves. This machine, what had happened, in fact, was Walter Pigeon had used the machine, connected himself to it, expanded himself out, and all of a sudden, the monsters, the fears that were in his mind, took over and created that particular monster that, in this case, was attacking originally his crew and then the crew of the ship that came to rescue them. And I think this is, the, this is why I think this is the greatest movie about technology. This is the real fear about technology. It's not about is an artificial intelligence going to take over, or is this machine going to malfunction? It's about, are we capable of actually using that technology? Or do we understand what's going to happen when we ourselves have the power to do these things remotely, all the time, automatically? Ultimately, it's monsters, as he says in the film, monsters from the id, the deep subconscious, that are the things we should fear, not the technology itself. Which really brings me to the other great science fiction film, and in reality, it's actually a documentary, I think, which is Her. And Her, one of the things that's happened in technology films is often in films you see the far future. Think about Terminator, the world was going to come to an end. All these things were happening in the future. And if you are an aficionado of William Gibson's books, he was always writing science fiction about the future, and at some point he suddenly flipped and started writing science fiction about the present. And the reason is, we've kind of caught up with the future. And her is a very good example of this. It is not a very far distant future to imagine what's happening there. And the technology is completely unimportant in this film. It's the reaction of the humans to the technology that matters. And what happened in that film is an incredible amount of alienation and a society in which it's actually easier to have a relationship with a machine than another person. And this is where I think we come back to the message of Forbidden Planet and those monsters from the id, which is deep down there's that lizard brain and we have to understand its impact when we use technology and not really just think about the technology itself. Thank you. <laughs>